We're still in the book of James. We've been studying this. This is now the fifth installment, and I'm so excited to continue this. James just gets all up in our business, and today is not going to be any different. Honestly, it's like the, the, probably the hardest topic that James touches on is, is the one we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be looking at James chapter Three, and let me just kind of preface it with a little bit of question for you guys. Have you ever been like in a, in a moment where, where it might've been a heated or just like a, a quick exchange or in a situation where right when you said the words, you were like, ah, you tried to grab them back. Like, like you knew that, that immediately when the words passed your lips, you're like, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> That's not even what you meant. And it's just, you try to grab those things back. Anyone ever been there? Am I the only one? Am I the only one? Okay. So this is what James is going to talk to us about today is like, why does that happen? Why are, 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 why do our words get away from us? And it doesn't matter if you're married or you, with your friends or with your, with your kids and the way we communicate and how quickly we can. Some of you probably said the wrong stuff in the interview. Wish you could take that back. Or have you ever been on like a first date or something? And you're like, like, dang, I should not have mentioned the last dude. What am I doing? <laughs> like, and you're just like, dang it, just, well, let's just end this right now, okay? Let's just go Dutch on this thing. Um, five chapters, it, the book of James, it just is full of great stuff, man. You could probably read the entire book in like 15 minutes, but we're taking our time and taking it section at a time. I, this, the topic um, today is how to tame your tongue. And James actually talks about your tongue or your words and your language and your speech. He actually talks about it every chapter of James. He brings up how important in some way our tongue is and our words are. So this is extremely Im important to James. It's important to God. We, we talked about this in, in chapter one. I told you I was gonna come back to this. I was gonna give you a whole installment. James chapter one, verse 26. This was like in, I think, the second maybe week of our series. He says, if you claim to be religious, now no one here wants to claim to be religious. That's not like a good word for us. No one wants to be religious. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. Amen, you guys. But what James is talking about here, religion, that word means your service to God. Okay, that's what it means. Like, like so when you, when you read this, think about your service to God. So if you claim to serve God, but you don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself and your service to God is worthless. That's what he's saying here. And that's why it's so powerful because we live in a nation of talkers. Everywhere we got like, you're listening to it on the radio, the, pod, the YouTube, YouTube and, and, and TV, you're just listening to talk, 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 talk. Everyone is talking. If you were to take all of your words, the statistics say, take all of your words, uh, you could fill one, in one year, 66 books with your words, in which every book being 800 pages long. Some studies say that, that women speak twice as much, they use as, twice as many words as men, but all the ladies in here know why, because they gotta tell you twice to do it. Huh, what? What? What'd you say? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you take three or four times, what? What? And she, by the fourth time, she's like, I'm done. I'm just, I'm done with you. Why, why even try? Some of us have a real talent for saying the wrong things though. We got it like, like, and I believe we're living in the most vicious culture. Like the climate in our culture, at least in my lifetime, I, I've never experienced the hate and the vicious nature of the speech that people are using like on a daily basis. We live in a generation where there, everyone's encouraged to comment. Comment on it, comment on, say something, comment and comment uh, again. It's like, in, in comment, like the moment you think it, share it. And you're gonna learn today, like that's not a good place to be. That's not a safe place to be. So as we break down the book of James and James chapter three, all the way through verse 12, James tells us there's three things that show us the power of the tongue and, and how God takes this thing I believe more serious than most of us take it. Like the words that are coming out of our mouth, like how we are using our language and our tongues. And I think this is, this is so important because Christians love to categorize sins. And I think we do a good job of that. Like there are massive ones we put in the pile over here. We're like murder and adultery. And these are the bad ones. I'll never do those. But then we have these other ones over here in this pile, they're kind of gray. 
you know, like, like flattery and, and, and boasting and, and, and maybe even lying. And, and uh, you need to know that God puts those in a much bigger pile than you put them. And I hope to add a little bit more weight to the things that are coming out of your mouth today that you would see the importance, the weight, the value of that. In fact, there's only one place in the Bible where it says that God, where God says, I absolutely hate this. I don't know if you know, do you know God hates stuff? Like, yes, absolutely. God, God has some things that he hates. And in, in Proverbs chapter three, verse 16 through 19, it's not in your notes, but there's over almost half of the things that God says he hates actually have to do with your tongue. Look at this, Proverbs chapter three, verse 16 through 19. It says, God says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are actually detestable to him. Like he does, so look, what are those things then that God hates? Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent, innocent blood. So there it is, that murder thing. It's in the pile, it's there, okay? Some of you are like, that's oh, not as bad. No, it's bad, it's bad. A heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, and a false witness who, who pours out lies. And here's the seventh thing that he says are like, those I hate, this one, he says, is detestable to me. A person who stirs up conflict in the community, who just stirs up the drama, stirs up the issues, and just kind of, like Proverbs, it, the whole book, is, it's a book of wise sayings, and most of the book has to do with your tongue has to do with your, your language. So there's three things that James points out to us. Why, why it's so important the words, our tongue. Write some notes to me. Here's the number one thing that James says. My words will actually determine my direction. My words will determine the direction of my life. So where are you headed in life? You just think about this yourself. Where are you headed? 10 years from now, where do you see yourself? Where are you headed? You wanna know a good answer to that is? Look at your conversations today and you'll see where you're headed in 10 years from now. Just look at the nature of your, what do you talk about the most? Because your words determine your direction. And this is so important because the direction of your life, not the intentions of your life, determine your destination. Some of you have really good intentions of your life, but the direction of your life is not in line with the intentions of your life, and therefore you're gonna arrive at the wrong destination in your life. This is so important because your words are actually what's pointing you in that direction. Just by changing your vocabulary, you can transform your destiny. Like your words set the course. And James gives us a couple of examples. In chapter three, verse three, he says, we can control a very large horse by putting a small bit in their mouth, just a small metal thing in their mouth. By controlling their mouth, we can turn the whole animal wherever we wanna go. You think about it, like a 2,000 pound stallion and this 95 pound jockey, you know what I mean? This little dude controlling where just by this tiny, just by a little bit, a little bit. And that's, I want you to think about that. Just a little bit of, just a, it was just a little bit of word. It's just a little bitty word. That little bit word can change the course of someone's destiny. It, it could just, it could change the direction of your life it could change the direction of your kids. It could change the direction of your, it, it just, it, that small thing, just a little bit, that's all it is, is a little bit, and that animal goes wherever we tell it to go. Or he says a second example, take ships as an example. A tiny rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot wants it to go, even though the winds are strong. So you imagine the big, a big ocean liner, like cruise ship kind of thing, battered by the waves and the wind, and yet this tiny rudder, this tiny little rudder sets its course, Rel relatively small thing. Our words are like the rudder. They either keep us on course or get us off course in our life. The way that we're speaking, the language that we're using. And as a parent, I am overwhelmed at times with the awesome influence that we have with our words to either build up our children or destroy our children. To, to, they're so impressionable. He says they turn this this. This ship can turn. The language there is using in, in Greek is to steer, right? That's your language. The, your tongue is the steering wheel of your life. It's the guidance system that, that if you don't like where you're headed, then change what you're speaking. 
That's it. It's just, I tell you, I know, I know it's a small rudder, but that small change, that small shift in, that, in your language can change the direction of your life, the words that you're speaking. You think about the Israelites when they were delivered from Egypt and they were delivered from slavery, and they were getting fed this manna from heaven, and, and then all of them, they, they started complaining about the manna, and, and are we just gonna die here? And every one of them, because of the complaints of their lips, they were not allowed to enter the promised land because what they allowed to complain and to criticize against God in the middle of their wilderness, in the middle of their trial. You young people that are here today, like, come. That, that have maybe an issue complaining and criticizing against your parents. You better be careful because those, those words that you're choosing about them, they're, they're, they're setting the course of your destiny. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 20 says, for you young people, listen to this. If someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out into pitch darkness. He says, you'll miss the purpose of your life if you're known for somebody who curses their parents, yeah, but pastor, you don't, they're mean, they're evil, they're rude, you don't know my parents, they're terrible, they don't love God. I understand that you don't have to agree with them to honor them. You don't have to. You don't have to agree with someone to honor them. The children of Israel, when they were actually going into the promised land, you remember the story in Numbers chapter 13, they, they sent 12 spies out to inspect the land and, 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 and bring back a report of the land. 10 of them came back with a negative report. I call it a negative confession. And some of you are living with a negative confession over what, and it's in contradiction to what God says about you, God says about your future. It's a negative confession. Look at this in Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. It says, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession. Everybody out loud, the highlighted words, one, two, three, for we are well able. Yeah, I wanna be a well able kind of person. Like, like that's, that's the kind of person I wanna be where I look at the situation and I go, yeah, I'm, it's easy to complain. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to say things like you see it, but God doesn't want you to say it like you see it. He wants you to say it like you believe it. Come on, amen, somebody. Like, stop saying it. That's easy to criticize and complain. It's easy to say it like it is, man. God doesn't want you to speak that way. He doesn't want you to say what is. He wants you to say what's not, like it is. Come on, somebody. You have a choice. You can change the direction of your life. We are well, I mean, I'm just trying to encourage you today to change the the language you are using, it doesn't matter. It looks like there's giants in the land and there's obstacles. No, no, no. With God, we are more than conquerors in Christ, okay? I can do all things through Christ and strengthens me. I'm not gonna allow a negative report. I'm not gonna allow what my eyes see and what this season sees and what the, what the media tells me. I'm not gonna allow the negative report to sit in me because I am well able to overcome it. Amen, somebody? And then these other, people, these other men, it says, they had a different report. We are not... Able, no, 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 we, we can't do it. Look, here's what I want you to see, that we shape our words and then our words shape us. Amen, somebody? You shape them, you shape your words. And the very words that you're using are gonna shape your destiny. Our words determine our direction, James says. Secondly, my words can destroy what I have. They have power. Proverbs says that there is life and death in, in, in the words, they can destroy everything. You don't need a knife, you don't need a gun to do the destructive force, the power of our tongue. And I'm hoping today that it has raised the awareness of something we just throw around so like loosely and thoughtlessly that, that this, this, this thing that James is talking about has the power to destroy your career, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your children, to destroy your your calling. Verse five, he says, likewise, a t the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire. Look what he says, by a small spark. We see that all the time here, don't we? In, in California, in our, in, we see, there was a, I was reading this, I was reminded of a fire in 2018. It was just, I don't know if you guys remember, it is like the greatest fire, I think. And I don't know if it was world history or California history, but it burned for like Three months, a half a million acres burned up, like $300 million worth of stuff burned up. And, 
and so the destructive force of this thing, they, they discovered the genesis of that 2018 fire, and it was actually a camping group. Someone had a hammer and was driving a metal tent peg into some dry ground where there was debris, and a small spark flew off. And they didn't even notice, like, like it was just a half a second of a spark, a half a, a billion acres of damage by a half a second spark. I wonder what kind of damage is being done by your half second remark. What kind of fire is being, what kind of destruction that is being done by just that quick little, little tongue going off. It says, he says, he goes on, the tongue is also a fire and he gets really passive here. You know, James, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body sets the whole course of one's life on fire. And then he gets really passive. Check it out. And it is itself set on fire by hell. <laughs> James is hardcore, man, but I love him. We live in a culture that just almost encourages you, though, to comment, right? To just, just go ahead, say it, say it, and just comment again and get on there. And, and, and I'm, just telling, I'm just telling it like it is, man. I'm just saying it like, like what it is. Okay, your words may reflect, reflect reality, but God has called us to, to transform reality with our words, not to reflect reality. So just because it's real doesn't mean you should say it. Doesn't give you the right to say it. Doesn't justify the words that are coming out of your mouth just because of the situation that is. That's not, that doesn't justify anything. You're not to say it like it is. You're to say it like it could be. It's your words don't have to reflect the reality. Your words can shape reality. My words have destructive power. Remember in chapter one, James said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. The problem is we, we just, we get to talking when we're angry. When we're angry, we just get da, 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 and we just start, just, just, we start firing away or, or calling or whatever it is. We just, we get to talking when we're angry and it's caused all this destruction. And listen, you're destroying trust in your relationship. You're destroying the peace in your home. You're, you're, you're destroying the, the reputation of others because of your, your quick to be angry, you're quick to speak, and you're, you're slow to listen. We're doing the exact opposite of what he tells us. So in the moment of our anger, we're spouting off all this junk. Destruction, destruction, causing destruction. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13, he says, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. And here we, we don't gather the facts, we don't seek to understand, we just let it rip. I heard someone, an acronym, they said it, for this is WAIT. WAIT, W-A-I-T. I had to use this acronym just this last week. But WAIT, it stands for, what, why am I talking? <laughs> just stop for a moment, just go, wait, why am I talking right now? I just need to... Just, just here, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19. Look at this. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and shut up. That's what it says. And keep your, wait, why am I talking? Wait, 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 wait. wait. There was, I was so tempted this week to comment back on Facebook. I so was, you know what I mean? I'm usually really good about it, but it just shuts a nerve, man. And, 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 and I was just like, thanking God for his goodness and his grace and posted some, and I even posted some pictures of like the things that we were coming from. I said, God is doing, here he is again, doing, we're going to go into reno mode and build a kid's center. And man, God is good. And of all, and here's why it struck a nerve. It was another pastor in another state commented underhanded and said, oh yeah, well next time maybe you should think about planting a church or giving some of that away. And I just was like, Dude, you, why, why? We're on the same side, bro. Why? Uh, what are you doing? This is kingdom. This is kingdom growth. This is, and I just want, I just wanted to, man, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to tell him, like, are you kidding me? We give thousands of dollars away every month to church plants and church planters, thousands of dollars every month to existing churches to strengthen them. We spend time coaching and resourcing and all these things. And here you go, don't know the situation, judging it from your own perspective and insecurity, spouting off. Now look, we all do it though. Y'all do it. Every one of you do it. You make an assessment or a judgment about a situation without understanding all the facts. And here's what, here's what James is saying. Wait, 
Oh, why are you talking? Shut up. Shut your mouth. You don't have all the facts and it's foolish. Not only like the duration of the words that we're speaking, like we're speaking a lot of words, the duration, but I think it's also the direction that our words are going, that we need to be careful. Because I'm not saying that you have to like everything. I'm just not sure that the things that you don't like have to go in every direction. Okay, I, 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 I tell this to my staff and my pastors, it's, this is a staff value because I don't want to lead a whole bunch of people that are a bunch of yes men that are just like, here, I'm just going to pay you, you shut up and do it. Okay, that's not how I lead. That's not what I, what I want. I, if I'm doing something that isn't right, I tell my team, you're free to have another idea. Like, like if I'm doing, like if you, there's a better way to do it or if you don't like something that I'm doing as a leader, you're, you're please say something but you better make sure that that comment goes in the right direction when you think it, okay? Because you can, you can think it, but just, just make sure that that comment does not go below you, that it goes in the right direction to me, okay? Like I teach them, like go to your direct report, go up with it, not down with it, because if all you're doing is you're thinking it and you're saying it to the wrong people, that's gossip. That's what gossip is. So here's how I say it. You pass negatives up, and praise down. Because here's what's happened. You're, you see it, but you don't, you're, you're, what you don't like, it's okay not to like it. It's okay to see a, it's okay to think critically. It's okay to even have a, a negative, like, wait a second, this isn't, it's okay. I'm just saying it's not okay to take that in every direction. That's what gossip is. It's taking that to the right person in the right direction. And if you were to just pass that, that, that to the right place, negatives up and just praises down, I'm telling you, this would be a value that every one of us need to embrace, I think. Not just staff, not just pastors, but what would happen if you actually took your negatives and your criticisms to the right people instead of behind their back? What if, what if all you did was praised them behind their back? You just said those positive things and encouraging things behind their back, but when you got to their face, you told them what you, really, what you saw and what you thought, and you sought to understand, okay? Why? Because your words have power. Your words have the power to destroy. And the most important point I think James makes, and he's helping us to see, is number three, that my words, they actually are revealing what's in my heart. And remember where we're studying here in, in James chapter three, we, we just finished James chapter two, and we talked about real faith right? And what real faith is. And James was like giving us the examples of what, hey, some, some fake faith. There's like an intellectual faith that isn't really faith. There's an emotional faith that isn't really faith. You, you know, there's, there's just a dead faith. There's a, there's a deceived faith. He's just, it, but then there is a dynamic and a real faith. And then he rolls right into this, the, the, the power of our tongue and what is on our tongues. And the reason is because here is another great indicator of if you have real faith. What is coming out of your mouth reveals what is in your heart. The first thing James does, verse nine, James points out how inconsistent we are sometimes. He goes, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we turn around and we curse people like who have been made in God's likeness. He says, out of the same mouth come these praises. Oh, worship God, we love you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And then we turn around and we, and we curse our neighbors. My brothers and sisters, he says, this should not be so. Like, like this shouldn't happen. There's, there's an, at church, we, we have the privilege of giving God the highest praise, but then we get in the car and now... And how different the melody changes, you know what I mean? There's just a different tune there. It's amazing how quickly that can change. One minute we're, praise God, and the next minute just, shut up, shut your mouth. <laughs> James is saying, what an incredible contradiction is happening here. Something is wrong with this picture he's bringing light to. Something's wrong with this. And why do we speak so loving? So kind and compassionately to those that, that we love, but with another breath, we can lash out at them. And this grieves me so much, man, that, that I can be harsh and impatient with those who I love the most. 
Anyone else have that problem in here that you could be harsh or impatient with those who are closest to you, those that you love the most? Why do we do that? James tells us, verse 11, he tells us why. He says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? In, in the Bible, the spring was always a representation of your, of your heart. He's saying, hey, can both the fresh and clean come out of the same? Well, my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear fruit figs? Well, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He says, what's coming up out of the bucket is what was down in the well. Whatever's in the well comes out in the water. Whatever's in the tree comes out in the fruit. Is it, is it logical at all, any likelihood that an apple tree is gonna produce peaches? No, it's not. So here's, here's the real problem. Check it out. The real problem isn't my tongue. The real problem is my heart. Okay, that, that's what the real issue here is. It's not, it's not oh, I need some new tools here. And, and sometimes we say the, we, we, our, our words get ahead of us and, and you say something like, well, I, didn't, I don't know what came over me. It's so not like me. I'm so sorry for saying that. Who are you kidding? <laughs> what was in you came out of you. That's what happened there. Okay? So let me, let me, let me show you the example here because the problem isn't the tongue. The problem is the heart. And let me show you the the correlation that you can maybe even see in yourself, where you can see in maybe other people, because someone with a harsh tongue has an angry heart. Someone with a negative tongue has a fearful heart. Someone with an unfriendly tongue has a hard heart. Someone with a critical tongue has a bitter heart. Someone with a boasting tongue has an insecure heart. Someone with a filthy tongue has an impure heart. Someone with an overactive tongue has an unsettled heart. Someone with a judgmental tongue has a guilty heart. Someone with an, on the other hand, someone with an encouraging tongue has a happy heart. Someone with a gentle tongue has a loving heart. Someone with a controlled tongue has a peaceful heart. See, the tongue isn't the problem. It's the heart. Verse 7 and 8, chapter 3, he says, All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed. And they have been tamed by mankind. But check this out, he says, but no human. It is humanly impossible to tame your tongue. It's a restless evil, which, which means it's humanly impossible, but only divinely able. God, you can't do this alone, he's saying. Like, you can't do this alone. Like, God is the only one who can fix the real issue because the issue is not really your tongue. The issue is your heart. And, and what James is saying is, you can't give yourself a new heart. You can't do it. You, you can't change this party. Only The human can't tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And here we are with, with this poison sitting in our heart. And, and listen, we're literally, some of us, infecting and poisoning the people around us. You're poisoning your spouse with your negative, your critical, you're pulling them down, and, you're, and maybe it's just like, oh, I'm good 90% of the time, I'm so good. Yeah, but just that little bit will change the course of your marriage, will change the course of your kids. I pro like most, you're great fathers, you love your kids, but it's just that small bit right there that they'll remember forever. I, I, they will. My kids still, I try to, I try to like and be very affirming, but still, just the other day, one of my daughter, one of my daughters was like, I remember this one time we were sitting at the parent teacher conference. I had all A's but one B. And the first thing you said was, Oh, we can fix, we can get, we can work on that B. And she said, I remember that. And this was like 10 years ago. And I'm like, oh God, I'm so sorry. That I'm so you did you're such a good girl, I promise. It, and I didn't mean to, and I was just probably just affirming the teacher, and like, sure, we can work on that. And, but just that little thing, just, just they remember these things forever. How do we do it? How do we tame this tongue that is humanly attainable? Well, well it's humanly untamable. It's divinely tameable. But just because God is the only one who can do it, does that mean that we have no part to play in this? Like, hold on, it's just, it must be up to us to God. No, there's... There's a part we have, there's a cooperation that we do play in bridling and bridling our tongue. Here's how, and it has to start right here. Number one, take some notes with me, guys. Number one, we gotta allow God to change our heart. 
not to get some new tools. You don't need to do something new. You need to become someone new. That, and that's the reality for every single one of us. We need to be transformed from the inside out. We need to be made brand new. Hebrews chapter 8 tells it like this. This is the covenant I will establish, God says, with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them. He says, no longer is it going to be in a book, in the pages of some book that I have to study and memorize and try to do. No, God says, I'm going to put it in you, not, not have something that you do. It's going to become you. I'm going I'm to put it in your hearts, he says. I will be their God, he goes on, and they will be my people. No longer will you need someone to, to teach you this stuff. You're going to need a teacher for all this. No, you are go I'm going to make you know me, he says. You won't need to be taught about me. You will know me. And some of you are faithful. Some of you are good people, and you're trying to do you're trying to do good, and you're doing it for the most part pretty well, um, I would say. But what you need to be is brand new. What you need to be, what we need is a new heart. We need to be transformed. And then, listen to me, and then let him do it every day. Like every day. I still, I still have this, this daily prayer, Proverbs or Psalm chapter 19. I encourage you to make this like your daily prayer prayer. If you want to be someone who, who is wise and who, who, who has actually tamed their tongue and does not use it for destructive force, but for life, this is a great prayer to pray every day. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. Notice that those two are always together. You can't get away from it. Your words and your heart, it always, those two are always connected. Be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer, still to this day, I get up early and I ask God, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, fix my heart so my words can be right. God, fix my heart so my words can be right today. What would it look like if you just every day went to God and said, God, fix my heart right now so my words could be right? If you ask God, that's the first thing you need to do. If you really want to be someone who is wise and tames this tongue, you need a new heart. Ask God to change your heart. And then number two, put a filter on what I allow in my heart. Okay, because if I'm honest with you, this, this one's frustrating to me because you want a positive life, but you'll never have it if you keep allowing the negative influences and the negative people have access to your life. You'll never produce anything positive if all you're putting in and around you are negative. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what's coming out of your mouth is what's in your heart. The good man, look what he says, brings good things out of the good that he's actually stored up in his heart, which by the way, good job today for coming to church because what you're doing is you're storing up some good in your heart right now. We gotta store up the good because whatever's in there is going to come out. But be careful, he says, because the evil man brings evil things out of the evil that got in there. So it might, it might be really good for you to ask yourself, like what's, what, what am I storing up that's causing the evil to come out? Instead of like, 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 what am I putting in there that's, ca that's causing me to say the things that I say to my spouse or to my kids or to when I'm angry or, or what, what, what am I storing up that's causing me to speak the way that I'm speaking? Proverbs chapter four, verse 23 says, above all else, guard your hearts because everything, everything flows. Everything in your life flows from it. Then we can do this last thing, which... Man, I, when I was praying and preparing, I, I envisioned, I was envisioning you like leaving this church like with a new commitment, with a new, with a, with a new zeal to be the kind of like followers of Jesus that, that people take notice of where, where you can actually do this. Number three, where you are being the kind of believer that speaks life instead of death. 
Like, and I pictured you going back to your workplaces and to your homes and actually people going, what in the world happened to you? And you go, I went to church on Sunday and I made up my mind. I'm not gonna speak any more death. I'm gonna be a life speaker. I'm gonna be a builder, not a destroyer. I just made up my mind, man. I'm changed from the inside out. Being an agent of change in a destructive and ugly world. You know, in Acts chapter four of the disciples, the Bible says that they took notice because they were just ordinary men, but they took notice that they'd been with Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you change this one thing about you, if you can get God to give you a new heart and start taming, the, allow God to tame your tongue and what's coming out of your mouth, people will start to take notice of your life. They will start to take notice of the life that is coming out of your mouth. Decide today to speak words of life. I got five types of words of, of life for you. Five different words that you can speak that are life. Here's the first one. Take some notes with this. Number one is words of affection. Words of affection. Don't be afraid to tell somebody, I love you. I love you. I'm praying for you. I love you, bro. I love you, man. Like, don't be afraid to just tell somebody that. Let them know you love You know, it's hard for some people to say. It may be hard for some of you to say. And, you know, I was discipling a guy years ago, and he was you know, someone who had been called to the ministry and was in, in, in a group with them. And, and I, just, I just noticed after a while, I, was just, uh, I would tell him like, man, I love you, bro. And he, he'd go, well, th well, thank you. And I, after a while, I was just like, hey, you can't say it, can you? <laughs> and he's like, well, say what? And I said, you can't say I love you. Come on, say I love you. And, oh, <laughs> and he just got all shy and red and like, and, and so he, and I got to like talk, like what's going on? And he told me a story, family issues, some things were hurt, put up a wall. He thought he was doing the right thing by keeping people out. But I told him, I said, you're gonna say, I love you, man. Before, before you leave my discipleship, before you leave this group, you're gonna tell me and you're gonna mean it too, bro, okay? And so I'll do that to some, some guys, some of you, here, some of you, the guys that go here, I grab them, I hug them, I tell them, I'm not letting you go, I love you, I love you. And, and they know, like, they better say they love me back or we ain't having second service. We ain't going to have the second service. Some of you need to remove the barrier and the wall that has caused you to, like, not release your affection. Because there's something blocking you from, from releasing the affection. Like, you know you, you have the love, but, but, but you don't, but it's not being, it's not being communicated. You're not expressing that life. And I'm telling you, if you don't, it, there's a void. All you will will be someone who is destructive in word. And, and we need to get, and I'm telling you, just do it. I know it's gonna be awkward. And I know it's gonna, you're gonna feel silly and sound silly. Keep doing it until it feels normal. I love you. I love you. You know, the, God the Father spoke that over his son. There's only two instances in the Bible where where we see the father speaking and communicating to his son. He, they communicated every day, but unfortunately we only have two instances in the scriptures where we see the father communicating to the son. It was at the baptism and the Mount of Transfiguration. And in both instances are the same exact words, the same words. And I've concluded the reason why is because it's what the father told the son every day. Let me show Matthew chapter three, one of the instances, this is the baptism incident, right after Jesus was, was baptized. The, the, the spirit came, and the Bible says, a voice from heaven, look at this, a voice from heaven said this, you're my son, I love you, I'm proud of you. You're my son, I love you, and I'm proud of you. Like, like I got my boy in here today, is he in here today? You're, hey, Caleb, you're my son, and I love you. And I'm proud of you, boy. And, and you're my church. Listen, I love you. I love you. I, you're my church. You're my family. I love you. And I'm proud of you. Okay. What did that hurt anybody? I don't. That doesn't hurt anybody to do to to release that love and affection. Be somebody. Be someone who has words of life. Just make a decision today to change that. Maybe it was hard for you, but today make a new decision, a new declaration. I know they didn't speak it over you, and it may be uncomfortable because because maybe they have hurt you and haven't showed you the type of love. Just decide today that you are going to get on God's side and stop speaking negative confession and say things like God says it. Speak words of life and words 
of affection today. Here's the second type of words, words of praise. Words of praise, and I'm not talking about the kind of praise that God gets. He's the only one that is worthy of that kind of praise. I'm talking about the praise that's, hey, great, hey, great job. Hey, you did good. Hey, great job on that. Hey, team, great job you serving today, our dream team, man, and the production team and our sound team and our slides team and all these photographers. All the great job, man, and those you guys serving in first impressions and stuff like that. I mean, way to go. You made people feel like this was home. And that's one of the main things that people say every time they come to Discovery, they feel so welcomed here. Hey, good job, team. Give it up for our team. Come on. What is it? Just be someone who offers praise to people. Proverbs 25, verse 11, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver, that it's both, it's both beautiful and valuable, he said. You're both beautiful and valuable. Speak words. My wife loves words of praise. We're, we're celebrating 20 years coming up here this month, you guys. 20 years. August 17th. It's amazing. 20 years. In 20 years, I, I love you more today than I did 20 years ago. And I'm so glad that I married you. I would do it all over again, Veronica. I love you. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me, second to Jesus. I'm just trying to set, change the environment, change your heart even by modeling something for you today. Like you can, you can have words of life, words of affection, words of praise. I love it, words of, words of encouragement, words of encouragement. I, I know it's tough out there, you guys, and, and I know it gets really hard, I get it. And, and even through what we've been through, but please, come on, y'all. I read, the, I read the, the last chapter of Revelation. We win, you guys, we win. So let's just start speaking words of encouragement instead of words that are caught up in our situation and season and start speaking, like, speak faith. Ephesians chapter four, verse 20, I love this. This is just a great model for those of our words. Our words, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, just don't let it pass. But only that what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. You can be a builder or a destroyer, and I want you to just make a decision today that you're gonna be a life giver, that you're not gonna destroy people behind their back. Some people think differently and treat people differently, not because of anything that they have seen or done, but because of the negative report that you gave them. Stop destroying people's reputation and be someone who builds them up. Be an encourager. Words of life, words of life. This is what we can be. Let's be different. So the world sees something different inside of you. Stand up and take notice. Words of healing. Write that down. Words of healing. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. Here lastly, and I love this one. It's my favorite. Words of faith. Words of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I think we talk too much about what we see and not enough about what we believe. Way too much about what we're seeing, not enough about what we're, what we're believing. You know, don't, don't, don't tell people who they are right now. Tell them, tell them what you believe they could be. You know, don't, don't tell your kids that. Don't tell your friends that. Don't tell your spouse that. Don't, don't, don't chop them down. Speak words of faith. Don't tell them what you see in their life right now. Tell them what you believe they could be. This is, this is what I do to you every week. What I do to you. You don't need me up here just beating you down and chopping you down and telling you what you already know. No, you need some revelation and insight of the Holy Spirit of the gap that's there, of the distance between where you are and where God wants you to be. But what you really need is someone to believe the best is ahead of you. That, that, that you need someone to believe in you. What you need is faith. Romans chapter four, verse 17. Abraham is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. I'm not gonna speak over you who you are in the moment, but who you can become. Amen, let's bow our heads. God, we just thank you. I pray that the weight of our words and our tongue would be increased today, that we wouldn't be so loose with our words. We wouldn't be so quick to speak, God, but we would be slow, 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 that we would wait 
weight, that we would be patient with our words, that you would add weight to them, God, that we would not use them as destructive forces, but life-giving force to, to not just reflect reality, but change reality. God, help us set the, a new direction today of our life by the words that we're speaking over our life, by the words that we're speaking over our relationships, by the words that we're speaking over our future, our destiny, our calling. God, set a new course today that we would speak words of life, words of affection, words of encouragement, words of praise. Let them take notice, everyone around us, that we've been with Jesus because the words of our mouth are different. They're different. They don't reflect what's around us. They reflect what we believe. There is a God who's working out all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Thank you, God. We want to be your agents today agents of change, agents of heaven, sent us out on assignments to be life givers today. Thank you, God. With every head bowed and eye closed, you're here today. And maybe what you need is, is a heart check. You need a new heart. You don't need tools and tips and practices and, and to fix your tongue and words. And you don't, you, you, it's, it's unfixable. The problem of humanity is unfixable. You cannot do it yourself. What we need is to be changed and transformed from the inside out. We need a new heart. And you're here today, and maybe that's where you need to start, just right there with this place of surrender, to stop being in control and give it to him. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. Right here, right now, God can begin that transplant, heart transplant and transformation process. Some of you need that for the very first time, and I'd love to help you make that decision. Some of you need it again, and, and I'd love to pray with you right where you are, if that's you. And I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out if you're in the audience today, but if you're here and you're ready for a new heart to be transformed from the inside out, I want to pray with you in just a moment. I'm going to count to three, and at the count of three, here's what I want you to do is just raise your hand. If you're online with us, just type in, I need Jesus. On the count of three, if you're ready for this transformation inside out, a new heart today, God says he'll give it to you. Come on, one, two, three, hands raised. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Change me from the inside out because I can't do it myself. I can't fix my mouth. I can't fix my life. I can't change what I did. You can only change me. Jesus. I surrender. Come on, leave that hand up. I want to see and celebrate all over this place, all over this place. I surrender, God. I'm not going to do it myself. I'm just laying it down for you to do it, God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, put your hands down all over this place. And now let me activate your faith. Will you whisper right there, right where you're watching, right where you are? Whisper this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender my life. I'm no longer going to try to fix it. I'm going to let you have it. Have it all, God. I surrender everything to you. Jesus, I declare you're my Lord. You're my Savior. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, God, for saving me today. I'm leaving here changed. I'm leaving here as a life giver. Someone who is a builder, not a destroyer. Change me, God from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, amen. Amen.